early morning in Vientiane, capital of Laos. Though it's before daybreak, organizers of the communist Patet Lao movement are out in the streets beating the drum to summon people to a very special meeting, a celebration of Indochina's latest revolution, the end of Laos's neutralist government and its replacement by a totally communist regime. The response was impressive. Over 40,000 people marched into the national stadium, passed posters showing the final triumph of Lao nationalism over American imperialism. As the crowd waited for the revolution's leaders to arrive, they sang patriotic songs led on by Patet Lao officials. of many fragmented cultures, and the development of an overall nationalism allied to communism has been deliberately encouraged by the Patet Lao to solidify popular support for the revolution. eventually made their appearance, the crowd was treated to a discourse by Pumi Vong Vichit, foreign minister in the old government and vice premier in the new. He and a succession of speakers all referred to this moment of destiny in Laos's history. The celebrations ended with both rulers and ruled giving clenched fist salutes and the stadium rang to shouts of Samsoy, victory. The new regime means not only a change of government, but an entirely new state. King Savang Vatana, titular head of the Kingdom of Laos for the last 16 years, abdicated, so bringing to an end a monarchy stretching back over six centuries. From the king's residence in Vientiane, the new People's Democratic Republic of Laos was proclaimed. The changeover carried out smoothly and without bitterness. Laos's new rulers even invited the king to be an official advisor to the government, a role they also reserved for another of the old regime's leaders, Prince Suvana Puma. He'd been prime minister of a series of supposedly neutral governments since 1962. But over the years, his real power declined as the Patet Lao gained more control of the country. For the past six months, he's been virtually a figurehead of a government that was communist in all but name. Suvana Puma's power has in fact been transferred to his half-brother, Prince Sufanubong who's been the most prominent Patat Lao leader during the last 20 years. He's now become president of the new republic. The new prime minister is Kaysone Pomivan, general secretary of the Lao People's Party. He's half Vietnamese and has close links with Hanoi, and it's generally believed he'll have more influence than the new president on the future course of events. For the time being, though, both new rulers and old leaders seem to be on the best of terms. Friendliness was certainly the keynote at the new government's first reception for members of the diplomatic corps. The heartiest congratulations came not unnaturally from the Soviet ambassador, whose country has more influence in Laos now than ever before. America's charge d'affaires was also there and seemed to accept philosophically that Patat Lao rule in Vientiane had become inevitable after developments earlier this year in the rest of Southeast Asia. The takeover in Laos was certainly no surprise, coming after communist victories in neighboring South Vietnam and Cambodia. Yet it's not wholly accurate to see Laos as just another Southeast Asian domino pushed over by the others. 
The communist advance in Laos had its own impetus and was many years in preparation. Geneva, 1962. Fourteen nations sign a treaty that's supposed to guarantee the peace and neutrality of the tiny kingdom after eight years of civil war following the French withdrawal from Indochina. The conference drew up elaborate plans, including an international control commission to see they were carried out. Though the commission met a few times, it never established any effective control. The agreement remained a dead letter. The fighting in Laos continued. In the early 60s, the military struggle was inconclusive. The royalists held the western half of the country and the communists the east. Prince Sufanuvong and the Pathet Lao were intended to be equal partners in a national neutralist government, but the coalition soon ran into disagreements, and in 1963, the Pathet Lao left the administration to go into open revolt. They set up their own headquarters at Sam Muir in the northeast. Much of the early fighting took place on the Plain of Jars, a relatively flat area in the north which got its name from hundreds of ancient stone jars that were scattered across it. The jars were over 2,000 years old and were used to store grain evidence of the peaceful and prosperous life the plain once enjoyed. But in the 1960s, most of them bore the scars of modern war. The war involved more than just Laotians. These neo-tribesmen, royalist and fiercely anti-communist, were often called the secret army because they were supplied, paid and organized entirely by money and officials from America's Central Intelligence Agency, though Washington never admitted this at the time. The Mios were tough fighters and bore the brunt of heavy communist assaults in the later stages of the conflict. The Laotian communists didn't fight alone either. Most of their hardware came out, and North Vietnam also supplied 50,000 of its own troops at the height of the war. Another secret operation was the massive bombardment of the country by American planes. From bases in Thailand, huge B-52s flew up to 300 sorties a day against suspected communist positions. With an elusive enemy hidden by miles of jungle, it was impossible to bomb accurately. Many innocent villagers were undoubtedly killed or made homeless by the raids. Washington never admitted the scale of the bombing, nor permitted film coverage of it. The only pictures released were those showing rice supplies being dropped to refugees. Early in 1973, with America's withdrawal from Vietnam complete, another agreement was reached over the future of Laos. By now, the Patet Lao controlled much more territory, and they agreed to come back into the government as equal partners in a neutralist government. The new cabinet was finally announced in April 1974. Prince Sufanu Vong didn't take a ministerial post. Instead, he became head of a national political council, whose job was to frame a new constitution. From this new position of strength, the communists were well placed to advance the revolution by political rather than military methods. But there were also pressing economic and social problems to tackle. The most important concerned the refugees. <laughs> 
Both Katat Lau and royalist officials toured refugee camps to explain government plans for resettlement and rehabilitation. The war had uprooted nearly 800,000 people, over a quarter of the entire population, and many had settled around Vientiane to escape the fighting. Now they were told they had a choice, to settle where they were or return with the government's help to their own villages. In a scheme organized by the United Nations last February, the first batch of 11,000 chose to return to their homes in communist-held territory in the north. For many who made the trip, the move meant a reunion with relatives and friends they had not seen for 10 years or more. The decision to share power was expressed not just in the cabinet room, but also on the streets of Vientiane, where Patat Lao and royalist troops kept law and order through joint patrols. The ceasefire agreement also controlled the number of soldiers each side could keep in the capital and other large towns. But what's agreed in Laos is rarely what's carried out and sporadic outbursts of fighting continued to disturb the general peace. The Mio tribesmen especially weren't happy with the ceasefire and tried to improve their position. But they found little support from other royalist troops, some of whom refused to obey their officers and declared themselves allies of the Patat Lao. Matters came to a head last May when whole units of the Royalist army mutinied after the Mios had been defeated and their commander had fled to Thailand. In Vientiane, Patat Lao students demonstrated against right-wing elements and forced the resignation of all five Royalist ministers. From this point on, the government ceased to be neutralist except in name. Patat Lao policies were adopted unopposed. The most obvious change introduced by the communists was the political seminar, which everyone from peasant to cabinet minister was obliged to attend. The sessions were conducted by trained propaganda officials, and participants were often required to repeat various written statements of Marxist ideology. This attempt to remodel and discipline society is taken very seriously by the Patat Lao, and severe penalties, including jail sentences, have been imposed on those who've refused to attend. Faced with a choice between indoctrination or exile, many chose to leave. In the last six months, 50,000 people, including teachers, doctors and businessmen, have sold what they can and taken the ferries across the Mekong to Thailand. <laughs> These professional people may be able to find a secure future in Thailand, but there are already 30,000 refugees from Laos living in camps across the Mekong, many of them Mio tribesmen who have no skills and who depend on welfare from the Thai government. In Vientiane, nearly every street in the shopping district shows some sign of the exodus. Meanwhile, the emergence of the new regime in Laos has created tensions along the Mekong, which forms the border with Thailand for much of its length. The new government has asked Thailand to repatriate all Laotian refugees, but the only things to have been exchanged so far are bullets. Patrol boats from both sides have been involved in skirmishes, and Vientiane has even accused Bangkok of bombing raids on Laotian territory. The Thais responded to all this by closing the land frontier in November. 
Since 85% of all Laos's fuel and food comes from or through Thailand, this has had a serious effect on the economy. Many garages have closed down and taxi drivers are out of business, at least for the moment. And in the marketplace, food has become very scarce. In a country where the average income barely equals 50 American dollars a year, these recent problems are a heavy extra burden. Inflation, which was 60% a year during the war, is now running at 70%. Some goods have come down in price recently, as foreign businessmen have sold off their stock prior to leaving. But the foreign community never catered for the average Laotian anyway, so these benefits have not been widely felt. The abolition of the monarchy and the official communist takeover has been received calmly, but with a few mixed feelings. The suddenness of the move and the feeling of general uncertainty about the future has cast an air of uneasiness over Vientiane, normally a relaxed and informal city. But the new regime has refrained from any ruthless demonstrations of power, such as the executions that happened in Cambodia. The American embassy is still open here, the only one in Indochina, though its staff numbers only 22, compared with the 1,200 who were here a year ago. American newspapers and magazines can still be bought, and cannabis is openly on sale in the market. Vientiane still retains its attraction for young Western hippies, and despite a desire for discipline, the government hasn't yet moved against them. But among the ubiquitous American t-shirts, there are now some with a more nationalistic message. America was to have played a vital role in the reconstruction of Laos, but the aid well, program has now been cancelled. In his last interview before he resigned, Prince Suvana Puma expressed his dissatisfaction with this state of affairs. Je ne peux que déplorer cette position des États-Unis. I can only deplore the Americans' attitude, he told us. In the Paris Agreement, they promised to heal the wounds of the war in Vietnam and in China, and I very much regret they didn't keep the promises they made us. The Americans have cancelled projects already started, and all credits have been stopped. I find that very mean of the great power. Laos is now receiving substantial aid from China and from the Soviet Union. What role do these two countries play in Laos? We ask des amitiés à la Chine et à l'Union soviétique. Nous ne pouvons pas nous permettre de nous immiscer dans leur querelle si le querelle existe entre les grandes puissances. Ce que nous demandons, c'est qu'il faut aider le Laos et garder le statut de neutre que nous avons obtenu en 1962. L'Union soviétique et la Chine ont signé avec nous l'accord de Genève. Ce que nous désirons, c'est de vivre en paix avec les Américains. Et nous souhaitons que Pékin et Moscou puissent intervenir entre Pékin et Moscou. En fait, les Laotians sont beaucoup plus vers la Chine que Moscou. Aeroflot, la airline soviétique, a toujours été ici. But now Russian pilots have taken over most of Laos's internal air services. Russian is heard almost as often as French in the shops of Vientiane. Soviet advisors, like their American counterparts before them, are usually big people, physically as well as politically, and their presence is obvious enough alongside the slightly built Laotians, which makes their attempts to avoid being noticed rather a waste of time.
About 800 Soviet advisors are presently in Vientian, and reinforcements arrive every month. American cars left behind from the days of American aid are put at their disposal. But despite Soviet aid, self-reliance is the watchword of the new regime. Posters exhorting the people to greater efforts are going up all over the capital. One example of self-reliance in action. The garden of the former American aid compound in Vientian turned over to the cultivation of vegetables. Patatlao cadres helped the townspeople to prepare the stony ground. It's a similar story in the countryside, although the economy here is so primitive it's hardly been affected by the events of the last six months. In fact, the self-help philosophy has received a tremendous boost from Thailand's action in closing the border. The government on its own could never have demonstrated so convincingly that Laos needs to be economically independent. So the closure has consolidated popular support for the revolution. The restraint shown by Laos's new masters in political affairs is also applied to religion. Even in the old government, the minister responsible for religious affairs was a communist. The new regime has deliberately tried to enlist the support of the country's Buddhist leaders, who've been promised complete freedom to carry on their usual activities. The courtyards of many temples serve as playgrounds for children and as meeting places for their local communities. The government has asked the monks to serve as teachers in the regular schools, and some Buddhist leaders see this as an opportunity to strengthen their influence. The monks are also being encouraged to grow their own vegetables as part of the national self-help program, and a whole series of small allotments have blossomed along the banks of the Mekong. It's a shrewd move by the Patat Lao because it identifies the country's religious leaders with the government's national aims, and so bolsters the communists' authority. It's been clear for many years that Laotians couldn't hope to regain their ancient prosperity without first learning to live in peace with each other and then working together for a common good. Both these conditions now seem to prevail. The new Prime Minister has said he wants to get rid of the old corruption, integrate the long-neglected minorities and create a truly national consciousness. But he's also made it clear that the first aim will be self-sufficiency in food. The Laotians, it seems, are going to have their revolution, but they're going to have to work for it.